good morning friends hope you are uh, all well and uh, since three days you had been listening to various languages like telugu tamil kannada malayalam and uh, so on let us talk about the telugu language literature and culture today what is the speciality of telugu even it is a dravidian language like the other languages but of course every language has its own speciality and telugu being the only cultured central dravidian language has its own special features so before going deep into that let us start this way language is the mirror that reflects the ideas polity ideologies aspirations knowledge ethics culture and arts of any given race telugu is no exception to this telugu language has a hoary past of 11 and odd centuries of literature andhra as a race was first mentioned in aitareya brahmana and ramayana and mahabharata there it has been mentioned both as a race and land and the, historically the first known empire of andhra pradesh the present andhra pradesh or whatever we call now was the kingdom of satavahanas shri mukha satakarni was the first known king who ruled andhra he declared himself free and his land a free kingdom when king ashoka died in 231 bc since then this dynasty ruled up to 3rd century AD this is the beginning of the historic development and historic regions in andhra pradesh since then chalukyas gangas and uh, many more people ruled this land and among them mostly to be mentioned are chalukyas and vijayanagara period because and the reddy kingdom these three kingdoms have contributed a lot to the hoary past of classical telugu literature and many art forms developed in these places in these regions in these regimes actually the very first literary work in telugu was from chalukyan era the poet first known poet or the first available book in telugu literature is andhra mahabharatam penned by nanneya he was the king he was under the king rajaraja narendra so before going deep into the literature let us talk about the language what is the speciality of telugu language as such the first and foremost thing what we have to speak about the telugu language is it is oval ending that is the speciality of this language this language sounds so sweet because of the oval ending nature it is very quite uh, good for singing naturally you can sing anything which ends in a oval when it is ends when some word ends in a consonant you cannot elongate it further but once any word that ends in a oval you can elongate it for any many times so this is the peculiarity and speciality of telugu that is why telugu is called italian of the east and the most well known poet of tamil sundar bharathi said sundara telugu just because of this feature and the other thing i would like to mention is telugu has two gender system the feminine gender generally it is it doesn't have a uh, finite verb system in telugu always the feminine gender goes with neutral in singular and in plural it goes with masculine gender whereas the other dravidian languages has all as ending of feminine gender this is not seen in telugu and the other way round we can even say that this is a old way of expression because many of the 
tribal languages of the Dravidian family has this particular pattern. Telugu is, as I already mentioned, it is an oval ending language. Because of that oval endingness, it co joins with any other language to form compounds. Compounds, as we all know, helps in the expansion of the language. Say, for example, prayapu merupu. This prayapu, this word is from Sanskrit. Merupu is a Telugu word. They join with each other. When you pronounce it as prayapu merupu, we need not, I mean, no one specifically until and unless they know these two languages and two language words, they wouldn't understand the difference. The same way, gulabi puvu. Gulabi is a Persian term. But the puvu which joins it, it, this is the speciality of this language. Say the same way the English, which we, the world, world is using now. Padavu road. Long road. When you say in English, long road, both are of the same language. But very commonly in Telugu, they use Yaduri Rodu, Podavu Rodu, Potti Rodu, all this. Because these kind of words join with other words to form compounds very easily. And the other thing I would like to mention to our allied audience is the kinship terms of Telugu. This is a peculiarity in Telugu. See, we have seven generations to be mentioned in Telugu. Generally, we have six generations in almost all the languages. But Telugu has a speciality, it has seven generations. Let me clearly tell you. We start with Muttata, who is a great grandfather, Tata, grandfather, Tandri, father, Koduku, son, Manavadu, grandson, Muni Manavadu, great grandson, Ani Manamudu or any Manamudu, son of the great grandson this is the seventh generation that is available in telugu as such this ani and any are dialectical variations though there is a dialectical variations it is very clear that this seventh generation pattern is available in telugu and see for examples like the rituals of a marriage or a threading ceremony the seven generations are mentioned one by one and only the then the ritual is complete. So this kind of thing is available. For example, this can be even said like this. Manucharitra, a 16th century work of um, Alasani Peddana, mentions this in his work. He says, Kukati velulu kolichi chesina kurini somidamma. The Kukati Velulu, that expression here, says the seven generations were seen to give to take a girl in a marriage. If a girl has to be married to a man, they see the seven generations of the both families before getting a marriage fixed. So this kind of speciality is seen in this language. And once this language any language, how will a language live for a long time unless it is recorded? Unless there is a recorded evidence, language cannot live for a long time. It has to pass from generations to generations. That is why we say the orally generated or transmitted languages are endangered because they are not written and they are not kept available for the next generations. That is what the whole world is planning to do at present. Record whatever language is available, whatever material is available, whatever the corpus is available in any said language and keep it safe for the next generation so that the language does not die. So hence, what we have to say is the language has to be recorded. How will be the language recorded? It has two ways to be recorded. Earlier, there were inscriptions through which languages were recorded. The inscriptions are mostly of two types. One, donating something to somebody or donating something to a temple. These are the two kinds of inscriptions. And one more kind is a king 
winning over another country or capturing another kingdom these kind of inscriptions were vogue in almost all parts of india and telugu is no exception to this there are many 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 inscriptions in telugu but these inscriptions have a limited field they are in they interest few people only those who are interested in script those who are interested in uh, lit actually in history those who are interested in uh, the temple culture these kind of people alone can go deep into inscriptions to read about the inscriptions to know what is there and how it can be expressed the other way of recording a language is literature and what a literature is as we all know literature is the record of finest thoughts that are available and that a man can think of so what happens when the literature is written it's in written form it goes from generations to generation it can be seen by centuries to centuries see in telugu the first available work is of 10th century so after even in this 21st century we are able to see those books either in the printed form or in the palm leaf form or in some form and now the digital form also so what is happening the literature is being transmitted from one generation to the other and why should we read literature after all in this society see we are mostly living upon or uh, technology nowadays then what is the use of literature in this technological world when the world whole world has become a small village a global village what does in what way does it help us this is a question for many people and there is another question also why should somebody read the classical literature why not read alone the modern literature what is the use of classical literature yes the classical literature gives you an insight of the previous history culture life ideas ideologies what a human life was in those days literature does not alone record this literature if you dig deep into literature you can find out certain things which are not seen anywhere else say for example um as i already mentioned about manucharitra a 16th century work pedana in his work write writes about a heroine he describes a heroine and he describes her only up to her navel he doesn't describe her legs does it mean that a woman does not have legs was she lame such a beautiful damsel and she was a semi goddess and she was not lame why did he not record her legs why did he not mention a word about her legs whereas after three or four verses he says she ran up to a bush to see hero that means she had legs because she ran up to the bush but why he did not record about her legs why he did not mention a word she had a beautiful face like uh, shining like a moon fine but what about her legs the reason is if we see the art of vijayanagara period most of the sculptures the depict women up to her waist the next it is either the shape of a tree or hidden behind certain things so this art form of sculpture has been represented in his poetry these kind of things are rare to be seen but can be seen another work for example of 17th century mentions about palm leaf manuscripts 
Why does he talk about uh, palm leaf manuscripts at all? He says these things have been written. The ethical poetry. He talks about ethical poetry. He says the ethical poetry was written in palm leaf manuscripts. And were kept safe and attached. Why was that so? That means earlier the recording pattern of literature was on palm leaves. They had stylus to write on palm leaves and these styluses were mostly made of iron. They used tender palm leaves and they seasoned those palm leaves. They wrote on them. They dried them within the house. They were never exposed to sun because they can get brittle, they can break down and they can be lost and they were protected. They were seasoned with neem oil and few herbal herbs to keep them for a long time. And another record we have is about the Raghunath Nayaka, his son Vijay Raghav Nayaka mentions his father had more than one lakh manuscripts which had Telugu and Sanskrit poetry, ethics, mythology, etc. So what does all this give us? This shows that the literature had been gathering the culture, was recording the culture as such since generations since centuries. This is what I would like to mention as such. Then only from 10th century you have Telugu literature. Is it available only from then? Was there anything available earlier to that? There must have been something which is lost, which is not available to us at present. How can you say that? Just because I am a Telugu woman, I can just say that? No, sorry, I can't do that. The reason is, there is a, a rhetorical work, a work written on rhetorics called Kavijanasriyam, records about the prosody, the poetics that were used by the earlier poets. But the fate of Telugu people is so bad that the poet did not mention the names of the poets or the works from which he has taken the examples. Or maybe he would have mentioned somewhere else, but not in the text. In the text, nothing is available. So, though we have so many examples, we cannot say from where he has taken them. But because he has given Telugu examples, it shows that there were literary works earlier to him, prior to him. If not, he couldn't have done that. Hence, we can say that this kind of literary facts has to be taken into consideration when we talk about a language, their culture, any particular given race. We can say that the literature has a record of its culture since many centuries which can be transferred to other people as such. And mainly I would like to mention few facts of this. As we all know man is a social animal. So is a poet. Poet is also a man in a society. He has to record something from his society. He sees many people. He records from his own society. Of course, there are poets who foresee certain movements. And whatever they have written become movement in later days. So hence, there are two kinds of poets. One, a poet who records whatever is being, whatever is happening in this society. And another kind of poet who foresees something, writes and later it happens. So let us talk about 
both the kind of pearls as such. So as I told you earlier, the first available or known text in Telugu is Andhra Mahabharatam. I start from there. Nannaya, who has translated it or transcreated it into Telugu, he has uh, done two and a half parvas, Adi Sabha and Aranya Parva. The rest of the 15 parvas were uh, translated by Tikkana and Erena has translated half of the um, parva, Aranya Parva. Hence, these three people, Nannaya, Tikkana and Erena are called Treyo of Mahabharata. Mahabharata in Telugu has tremendous name and fame. There are many sayings on that. Vinte Mahabharata Vinali, Trinte Garali Thinali. So almost, if you have to listen, you have to listen only to Mahabharata. Nothing else. No other text is needed. And if you want to eat, eat Vada. Nothing else is good. So such kind of sayings have occurred in Telugu, which proves the importance of Mahabharata. So what is the culture that has been reflected in Mahabharata? That is our concern. So for example, Dharmaraja has uh, performed Rajasuya Yaga. After the completion of the Yaga, he fed Brahmins. That was a custom in you know, those days. Even now, if you perform a Yaga or something like that, they uh, feed many people. And in those days, they were feeding Brahmins as such. So he fed. What did he feed? There lies the point. Nanya says, Paya sanna mulu padiveru brahmalaluku pettinche. More than 10,000 of Brahmins were fed with kheer and rice. Why kheer and rice? Why did he mention it so specifically? Because in the same place, in Vyasa Mahabharata, in Sanskrit Bharata, we can see that after the Rajasuya Yaga, Dharma Raja fed Brahmins with mutton. That means, at the time of Mahabharata or Vyasa Mahabharata, when it was recorded, eating mutton was not a taboo for Brahmins in those days. But by the time of 11th century, by Nanaya's period, Brahmins were not allowed or they stopped eating meat. So here, he is so specific in avoiding the meat and introducing kheer and rice. This is the culture hidden behind. This has to be projected as such. See, in the same way, a poet, whoever he may be, has a love to his own land, is very evident in the poets, poetry. How can we say so? For example, again, same Nanaya. Sahadeva, before the Sarajasoya, goes to invade the south. While invading the south, he did not mention Andhra. Why? Sahadeva jumped right from Odra to Kalinga to Dravida Desa. What happened to the place which is in the middle? So in present day's map, we have to say, from Odisha, he jumped into Tamil Nadu. Then he would have crashed Andhra Pradesh. What happened to that land? Why did he jump from here to there? He did not mention, he did not mention, the poet did not mention. Because the poet is a Telugu man, he did not want to mention that Sahadeva won the Telugu land. He invaded the Telugu land. He left it. These kind of niceties recorded by poets help us to understand what actually went on in those days after centuries. At the same time, 
Arjuna had to go for a pilgrimage. He went on a pilgrimage. And in the Sanskrit Bharata, he has seen Riman, Yamuna, Ganga, Brahmaputra, everything. He did not see Godavari. He did not come to the south. But Nanaya, who was of Raja Mahendravaram on the banks of Godavari, made Arjuna visit Raja Mahendravaram, take a dip in Godavari. So these kind of descriptions give us a sight where actually these people belong to and what they do and all that. And taking all this into account, in Indian system, bringing up a child, to put it in other words, from birth till death, there is a kind of celebration, one or the other. It is customary. The customs go by from birth. A birth of a baby. Then his uh, naming ceremony. He is being fed. He is being taken to the school. His Akshara Abhyasa, where he starts writing. And in uh, some people, in some castes rather, they have Upanayana, but some do not have. That's it. Secondary thing. And then their marriage. The marriage system in Indian society is very deep. It has a very strong roots. In other words, to put it in other words, marriage system is the root of Indian culture. See, many people, uh, even my students, have questioned me might be some of our friends would have had the, the same question. Many of you would have faced the same question. Ma'am, why should gods have wives? They, some gods have even two wives. Why should they have wives? Yes, why should God have wife? Is God a male or God female? Who can say or decide this? He, we call him omnipresent. We call him omnipresence. He's, he's everywhere. He's in the stable. He's in me. He's in you. He's everywhere. Then, what decides his shape? In Sufi Buddhism, I am just reminded of this. There is a small story. A man asked another person, See, how does a God look like? Then the saint said, see, I do not know, actually. I haven't, uh, I cannot explain you. You better ask somebody else. He was going on the way. He found an ant. He asked an ant, have you seen God? The ant said, yes, I have. How does the God look like? Oh, he is like me only. But the only difference is, I have a small head. He has a very big head. He has four legs more than me. So he was happy. Oh, so the God is like ant, not like me. He went a little farther. He met an elephant. Then he asked the elephant, Elephant, how does the God look like? The elephant said, He just looks like me. But the difference is, I have one trunk, he has five trunks. And see the pictures of the gods. They have four hands. Why do they have four hands? And why did the elephant mention five trunks? Anything and everything which is above us are more powerful than us. If we can work so much with our two hands, Imagine if we have eight hands, how much we can work, how much we can produce. So imagine if we have thousand hands, the same imagination has created God in such a plan. I am not an atheist. I believe in God. I am atheist. I believe in God. But 
what I would like to say is God does not have a shape. He need not have a shape. You think of him in the form you would like to. So this is the reason. Then why should God has have wives? The two, two. The reason is Indian mythology created wives to God just to say the family is the root of culture. Only the family can make you think of not just you but everything together. You are the only one. That is why I already mentioned seven generations in Telugu. See, you don't talk about one person. When you have to talk about seven generations, imagine every generation you have two or three siblings. How many are they? What is the capacity? How people, it gets expanded. Families expand into small habitats. Habitats into villages. Villages into countries. Countries into the world. The whole world into the universe. Vasudhai Kutumbam. The whole world, the whole universe is one family. So this family, how does it depend upon? What does it depend upon? The family depends upon the marriage. So to say that the Indian mythology says God has wives. So taking this into account, I would like to talk about the Telugu marriage system as reflected in Telugu literature. So few examples of that. As I already told you, Tikkana, the second of uh, uh, the trio of Mahabharata, he describes Edur Kolu. Edur Kolu is a ritual in every marriage where the bride's family, friends go receive the bridegroom, his family and friends before the marriage. They invite them, they take them to the place where the marriage takes place. So while receiving them, how do you receive? You have certain, you, t you give them something, you invite them in that way. So here he says, they went, they gave him few flowers, water to wash their legs, chandan and kumkum and some sweet to eat before they get into the marriage place where the actually the marriage has to take place. Why should you give them all this? See the turmeric, the kumkum which is made of turmeric, the sandal or chandan what we call, the flowers, all these are supposed to be auspicious. They think of these things as auspicious. So you give them to others before you call them. In this present situation, wherever you go, we have a beautiful explanation. Wash your hands, wash your legs before entering into your house. Wash your uh, hands with soap or alcohol or sanitizers for a long time. Why? Because we are afraid of COVID. But they were not afraid of COVID in the 11th century and 12th century. But still, it was a custom to wash their legs and hands before entering into any other place after coming from a journey. This is what has been described in this work. So, why, why was this described as such? Because how it takes place, how it is done. Why should it be done that way? So, other way, let me give you a few more examples about this marriage. Uh, a, Venkata, in a, a person named Venkata Kavi in his work Vijay Vilasam describes departing of the bride from her parents' place to bridegroom's house. She has been married. After the marriage is over, she is being taken to the in-laws' house. At that time, what is happening? The girl who has to go from her place to in last place, the girl is sad because she is parting from her parents. The parents are sad because they are parting the girl. 
So how 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 were they looking like? Tongali repala, totte du phaspa mula nadupa, totte lu mudhu patti kani kada puchu. How did he send her? The mother and father were sending the girl. Her eyes were watering, tears were rolling on her cheeks, and kajal was dripping through her tears. And uh, her uh, cheeks, which were smeared sandal, was becoming black because the kajal was being dripped by water onto her cheeks. At that time, the mother wiped her eyes and she asked her to go with her husband, a newly married husband. So, what is this? As I think you can see the slides that are being presented. I have put two frames there. One frame where the bride is crying. The other frame, uh, you can see uh, ha two hands being smeared in milk. This is the speciality in Telugu marriage. This is seen only in the Telugu marriage. I haven't seen in any other marriage. Because I have seen Tamil people's marriage and Canada's and also Malayalam people's marriage. Even I have seen some North Indian marriages. But this is called Appagintalu in Telugu. What they do, they bring cow milk. They don't even boil it. The raw cow milk is kept in a plate. The girl's hands are both dipped in. The palms are dipped. This is done by the girl's father. He dips the both girl's hands into the milk. And he takes the hands along with the milk. He will put it in the bridegroom's hands. And then he will dip the girl's hands again. The same to the bridegroom's father, mother and sisters. Why? I the milk, as you all know, is prosperity. So, along with the prosperity, I am giving my daughter to you. From today onwards, this girl who has been born and brought up in my house all these days and belong to my clan is being given to your clan. Her clan changes, her surname changes, everything changes from then onwards. So, this kind of Appagintalu, this particular ritual is very famous in Telugu marriages. And another thing, we, we all see divorce nowadays. How many divorce cases are being pending in the world courts? Let us not uh, go into the statistics of that. But somehow, polygamy and polyandry have been... Uh, uh, a long term pending or centuries together patterns. But these were not accepted somehow in the Indian family system as such in later on courses. By the time of 15th and 16th centuries, this was supposed to be a crime. In the 16th century, Peddana in his uh, Manucharitra expresses this. The speciality of this expression is a bird called Chakravaka. A bird called Chakravaka. It along with his um, girl swims in a pond and it sees the king and his two wives. Then it says Tagulu Nevadu Oka Taruniki Oka Niki Inelata Valachu Adiya Taruni Taruni is a girl. He says, See, I can believe that a man loves a woman. And a woman lost her heart to a man. This can happen with one man or one woman. But if you say that one man can love many women at the same time, is a lie. I cannot believe this. Hence, the king's love to these queens, the two or three queens, is not true. That's a lie. Either he doesn't love them or he had married them for some other reason. 
or something is wrong here. So, this is not the feeling of the bird as such. This was the feeling of the poet's day that was expressed in this poetry. And uh, what is the biggest wealth in the world? Has been a question since long. Yeah, we have the land, money, gold, diamonds, gems, precious stones. Yes, all this is, this is wealth. But what is the wealth that cannot be lost any time? A wealth which can be shared, but it develops. A wealth which can be taken to any place, but no fear of losing or being theft. What could be that? Yes, friends, you are right. It's knowledge. It's wisdom. So, this was called Vidya in Telugu or Sanskrit as such. Let me give a small example for this. What is Vidya? The knowledge, the wisdom. He calls it Arani Divya. Arani Divya, a light which doesn't put off. A light which never puts off. Akshaya Mahanivi. Akshaya, never ending, never everlasting. An everlasting treasure. Chupu Nava Ambujambu. Your eyesight. Eyesight? Yeah, see, I am wearing specs. Many of us have. The sight is not clear all the time. But wisdom makes your sight clear all the time. You go to any place, any country, any state, anywhere in the world. Your knowledge and your wisdom can come with you. You don't need a flight ticket. You don't need a train ticket. You don't need others' permission. See, to take an attendee anywhere, we have to take a permission. If I am coming to the session today, I can alone come. I cannot bring my daughter or my husband or somebody else. I cannot say this. Is the, they will come with me because I need a company. But my knowledge, what I have learned till day, I can take it to any way. That's what he says, this poet says. From this place, you go to any other place. It can come travel with you to any other place. And Todu Padu, which would help you all the time, which would stand by you, that is knowledge or education. Itarulu Korani Sumu. Even if somebody wants to snatch it from you, they cannot snatch this kind of wealth. This is the wealth which cannot be snatched. And what else? Vasudhan on the earth, vidya, education or knowledge or wisdom, whatever you call it, is the only thing that can help you, that can fetch you name, that can keep you ahead, that can make you chin up and that can make you familiar anywhere, any place which and a wealth which cannot be taken away from you which cannot be grabbed which cannot be theft so this is from Sashanka Vijayam a poet, a work by Sesham Venkatapati and what is the result of COVID. What would be the result of COVID? Many, many, many ways, many things. Let us talk about the employment and job opportunities. What would happen to the present employees 
and the future employees who are job seekers they might not get proper employment and uh, many might lose their employment because of this economics has fallen down everything has become collapse we all know that so but this was seen in a particular work in around 17th century he says anaga a, a man who has never done a sin a, a good person a virtuous person vinu please listen udyogi ki one who is an employee dhanam unde he has money kirti unde he be he is being praised he has some kind of name and fame cha unden at the end he will also die tanaranga this happens to every person nirudyogi ki one who does not have a job a jobless person dhana kirtulu lehu neither he has fame nor has money chavu tadhyamu he has to die he has nothing else to do why because he is jobless how can he feed himself either by hunger he has to die or everyone starts irritating him looking down at him you don't have job you are not fit for anything he has to feel sad and die see this kind of works that give us what actually life was see when somebody has said this in the 17th century four centuries back what about now what would happen to a jobless person in this present situation so this is a new not a new thing to the life there is a problem there will be a solution every problem somebody or the other would find a solution for and let me tell you few customs one particular custom if you are going to see somebody what would you do you either give take a flower or a fruit or a sweet to, when you visit somebody why this because they say if you are going to see a small baby you shouldn't go empty handed if you are visiting some elders you are not supposed to go empty handed if you are visiting your higher official he says king but nowadays your higher official you are not supposed to go empty handed you should by for courtesy sake that is what he says sutu kadaku tana koorchina sati kadaku velupu kadaku sadguru kadaku pati kadaku రిత్త చేతుల మతిమంతులు చన తగదు దిస్ ఇన్ ఆల్ ఇన్ ఆల్ దీస్ ప్లేసెస్ యూ ఆర్ నాట్ సపోజ్ టు గో ఎంటీ హ్యాండెడ్ యూ టేక్ సంథింగ్ టు ఆఫర్ ఇఫ్ యూ గో టు అ టెంపుల్ డోంట్ గో యువర్ విత్ యువర్ ఎంటీ హ్యాండ్స్ టేక్ ఎ ఫ్లవర్ ఆఫర్ ఇట్ టు గాడ్ టేక్ ఎ ఫ్రూట్ ఆఫర్ ఇట్ టు గాడ్ యూ డోంట్ హ్యావ్ టు ఆఫర్ ఎ గ్రేట్ థింగ్ బట్ ఎ ఫ్లవర్ ఎ ఫ్రూట్ which shows your affection your love your devotion that is more important and uh, i have a ever living truth for our friends to share kuri migala dinamulalu neramulu ennadunu kaluga neeravu mari aa kuri mi virasam bainanu neramule tochuchundu nikka musumati what does this mean sorry i know that uh, everyone cannot understand telugu and i have to explain before uh, giving the meaning of it kurmi is affection love whatever you call that dinamulu days in those days when somebody has affection or love or attraction towards somebody even if they make thousands of mistakes they will not be seen your mistakes is not visible to me because i like you you stand before me you sit before me you yawn when the class is going on 
See, for example, as we all are uh, teachers, we know this pretty well. One student sitting in our class sits and yawns. You will be wild with that student one day. On the other day, the same student yawns and you are not angry with him. Why? Just because you have developed a kind of affection on the student. Why do you develop a affection on the student? The first day when the student yawned, you pretty do not know what kind of student he is. Or maybe you were angry the way he behaves in the class. But once know, you know that the student is quite intelligent, studious, very good at his subject. Even if you he uh, yawns, you wouldn't mind it much. Say, okay, this fellow, you will call him out and say, Why, da? Were you feeling sleepy? Why you didn't uh, sleep well yesterday? You better don't do this in the class. So, these kind of things happen. This is what he says. When you have affection or love towards somebody, even they do some mistakes, you won't be pointing out them or you won't look at their mistakes. But once the affection is lost, the love becomes a hatred. Whatever they do is wrong. If they just wish you hello, why should this fellow wish me at all? What does he have to wish me? He need not talk to me. He need not wish me. And it is our feeling. We are expecting our feeling. See, this is the truth. Not in those days. Any time. That's why I, I think this is an ever living truth. Because the affection that you have on a human being or your pet, whatever it is, makes you look at their mistakes as the most neglected thing. But once you are angry, you are not in good mood, then the smallest mistake done by the others looks the biggest. So again, this is psychology. We have to correct ourselves before pointing out others. That's why we speak. The pointer make points uh, the other three fingers points us. So um, this is never ending because we are uh, time bound. Let me just uh, give you a few examples from uh, the literary zones of Telugu and end with that. See, I was actually asked to talk about um, the Telugu culture that is being depicted in the literature. And as such, I was asked to show you a few um, art forms as such. I have sent another uh, seven minutes um, um, recording, video recording to them. I think uh, you will be seeing this after listening to me. So the the literary genres that I wanted to mention is, the first and foremost is Udaharana. This is a unique uh, literary genre that Telugu has. This is completely based on the, um, what we call, case system. This has the accusative case, nominative case, genitive case. They write one poem in each case. And three different varieties of uh, prosody is used. And every case, three. Hence, 7 threes, 21. And an invocation will be there. And there are about 25 to 26 poems in every work. This is called Udaharana. Udaharana actually in Telugu means an example. The first poet who has written such uh, work was Palikurki Swamanatha. He wrote it as an example and that stayed as it is and that became 
a special zone in Delhi. Another zone I would like to mention is Avadhanam. It's a literary feat actually. What they do, eight people sit and question and one man answers all the eight. One man will say Nishidhakshari, where he stops him using a particular sound. If he says Ra, he'll say don't use Ma, so that he cannot make the word Rama. But he has to speak about Rama's greatness. The poet has to speak about the Rama's greatness, but without using Ma after Ra. So this kind of seven persons will be there. Eight poets will be sitting and all of them question and one poet answers. This is called Avadhanam in Telugu. This is a literary feat. The another zone I would like to mention is Thala Puranam. What is a Thala Puranam? Thala Puranam is, is not a normal Purana as such. Here three things are important. One, a presiding deity. Two, a place where the abode a place or a boat. Three, the water bed, either a river or a lake or a pond which was human created, whatever it is. These three things are important in Stala Purana. And the most important feature of a Stala Purana is any sin, even the biggest sin committed will be excused and you attain salvation in that particular place, in that particular abode. And if you surrender yourself to that presiding deity. This is the feature of Stala Purana. These three zones are peculiar to Telugu. And uh, I am really happy friends to exchange few of my thoughts or to talk to you all about Telugu language and literature. Hope I'm um, little clear, though I couldn't tell you everything in the limited time. I could try to um, put a kind of interest in you to learn about Telugu language, literature and culture more and more. Thank you all.